Hello and welcome to the Tillage Edge with me, Michael Hennessy. This is your regular update for all your tillage news and advice. Despite the desire for tillage farmers to use less pesticides, not only to protect the environment but also from a cost point of view, growing crops in our climate necessitates limited use of these crop protection products. Last autumn, crops were planted in good time, but this exposed them to aphid attack. The resulting BYDV infection can be seen in some fields more than others, despite control measures being applied. However, the severity of infection across the country varies, and we should ask, is this driven by location or temperature? Similarly, there's plenty of BYDV visible in spring crops already, despite being early sown. Is this due to a more active aphid this year, or are there other reasons? Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Louise McNamara from Chagas Oak Park to chat about aphids and BYDV control. Louise, I first want to ask you, that last autumn, and even into the winter and all the way through the spring, was quite mild. How did this affect aphid numbers? Yeah, so as you said, we saw a very mild winter um, in, in 2021, coming into 2022. And to reflect that in the suction tower network, so I'm sure everyone's heard of the suction tower network from the last podcast, but basically there's a 12.2 metre suction tower network in Ireland a Chagas one and there's a trap in Cork, a trap in Carlow and a trap in Ashtown in Dublin and we basically monitor aphids 365 days a year uh, to see what's flying um, around the country and what we saw in the winter just gone because it was so mild in Cork we actually saw a flight of aphids on the 31st of December uh, that was or paddy so that's the bird cherry oak aphid which can spread barley elder dwarf virus and then in Oak Park, we saw flight in mid-December. Um, then the start of this year in Cork, we were seeing a flight in January and February. And then in Carlo, we were seeing flight from mid-April. And Louise, would that be unusual? Um, I guess it, it, it reflects the, the weather conditions we have. Uh, when it's mild, like it was very mild in December this year. So it, it makes sense that aphids would be active. And I think we're seeing that knock on effect then in both the autumn crops and in the spring crops. So speaking of that, then, Louise, in terms of the different BYDV levels that are out there in the winter crops, maybe specifically, we look at those mm -hmm. first. Is there a crop or an area or maybe both affected more so around the country that you've seen? So I would say that there's some very bad infections around the country. Um, but in general, I would say early sown crops are worst affected. So early sown in autumn being worst infected. Um, and yes, there's some very there was some very bad infection. But I would say in general, most fields got good control. So those that planted later and and applied their well timed um, aphicide did get good control. Um, but it's the early planted ones they're most at risk. So the crop is um, has emerged when the aphids are still active. And when you say that some of them are some, there are some crops with high levels, do you mm -hmm. think that will affect the yield? Uh, in winter barley, yes, um, I would say that a high infection would probably affect the yield. The amount it would affect the yield um, depends on a number of things. So it depends on how early the infection got in. So the earlier the infection, the more impact probably on yield um, and grain quality. Um, and then also the strain of the virus. So different strains of the virus have different levels of severity. There's milder strains, for example, like MAV, and there's uh, more severe strains like PAV, PAS, and RPV. Um, and some strains cause stunting, which would be more associated with yield loss. Okay, so in terms of, you'd see, I suppose, in a number of winter crops, you see these little circles that are out there. Yes. And uh, we can get yellower leaves, and I suppose that's probably slightly different than, than you might get in the spring crops, which are, I suppose, more flecking across the field. Mm -hmm. You might explain to me how the circles come to pass. How does, how does that work in the winter crops in comparison to spring crops? So I suppose the pattern of infection you see in the field uh, reflects the aphids movement and life cycle at that time of year. So in autumn crops where, or, or winter crops, we're often most worried about secondary infection. So basically, uh, BYDV can get into your field in two ways. There's primary infection, which is the aphids flying in or coming in maybe from other fields or from, uh, from field boundaries and things like that. And then secondary infection is where after around 170 degree days, those aphids reproduce and their offspring then pick up the virus from where the adult has fed and then they spread virus around. So those circles you see are secondary infection. There's an aphid came in, 
landed, started feeding, spread virus, and its offspring continue to spread virus throughout the season. While when you see those specks everywhere in spring, that's more primary infection, so independently aphids coming in. The amount you see is a reflection on how mild it is, so the temperatures were very suitable for aphids to be moving. Okay, so yeah, so if, if temperatures are mild, the, the, they can reproduce. And on top of that, the, um, the I suppose the extended family, put it like that, can cl- crawl down the plant or crawl across the leaf, across the next plant and infect the next plant. Is that the way it works? Yeah, so aphids would kind of uh, reproduce or clone themselves in the area and the offspring pick up the virus by feeding on, on the plant. So they they aren't born with the virus. They pick it up then again by feeding as well. Um, and then aphids will will fly and leave an area when um, it's overcrowded or it's losing its nutrition or things like that. So that's why you get one area of a circle of infection. And then where you get all those spots everywhere, that just means that the the conditions were suitable for lots of aphids, aphids to be moving around. So lots of aphids independently came into the fields. And that's what you kind of see in the spring barley. OK. And from your knowledge of, of, of some of those crops that you mentioned that that had quite bad BYDV, should those growers have uh, completed more control measures on those crops, as in more frequently or further into the winter or maybe even the spring? So you're talking about the winter crops first? Sorry, winter crops, surely. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess maybe there could be a lot of reasons why each individual field had uh, more virus. It could be that they're in a higher risk area, somewhere coastal, where... um, it stays milder and if it's more active, it could have been that they planted very early and, and people have to plant very early for lots of reasons. Um, it could be that there was green bridge. It could be lots of different things. So you can't say one one statement for everyone. But um, I guess what we would have said maybe was that if your crop was in a high risk area or you felt it was there was aphids in the crop and you felt it was higher risk, if you didn't get out a uh, treatment in November, maybe you could still spray in December, January, February, and you can still get a positive yield impact. And that's because it's controlling secondary infection that we just talked about. And and that's the approach going forward again this autumn coming. You know, if it's hard to know what weather you're going to have ahead of time. But if you had a mild winter and your crop, uh, you felt, you know, it's at risk. I'm in high risk area. There's aphids active. I hadn't actually gone out in November but it's January now and it's still very mild, you can still benefit from a spray then. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the, 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 I suppose, the general strategies and maybe the farmer should be modifying that because I suppose within Chagas, we have a, uh, I suppose, a core strategy in terms of how to control aphids in the autumn time. Mm-hmm. But how static is that? Or should a farmer be kind of saying, look, that's the, the core principles, but I need to work around it depending on other circumstances that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, so those are, as you say, the core principles because they're based on many, many years of trials. But trials can't capture every field. It can't capture every area at risk. So they're kind of general principles. They're what would happen on average. So on average, we know that if you plant in September, you could benefit uh, potentially from two applications of an aphicide. If you plant in October, generally one would be sufficient. And then if it emerges from November onwards, generally, you don't need um, an application. But again, those are on average general rules. You do have to look personally at where you are. Like, are you in a high risk area? Are you coastal? Um, do you have if it's active in the crop that you can see and um, things like that? And then help you determine for your own field, what's the risk? So they're your guiding principles, I would say. Same with with, with spring zone. So we say that um, if you plant earlier, your crop is less at risk because the idea is you're meant to have a, generally a colder winter where aphids wouldn't be active till later. So if you sow in March, you get to grow stage 31 uh, quicker and um, therefore your crop is less at risk than ones in April. So yes, that's the guiding principles, but then you have to look at, at the season and say, okay, this is a really mild season. I'm going to walk my crops and see is there aphids there. Yeah, and I suppose on the other side of it is is, is the um, I suppose the fact that I know it was only weather you only call it weather within a year, but it may well be the case that our our, our winters do get a little bit milder. So it's mm-hmm. something to keep an eye on, I suppose, from a research point of view. Yeah, and then another thing I suppose to bear in mind is 
a lot of people when they were trying to make the decision about whether their spring crop needed an aphicide, they could look at their winter crops and they were seeing, you know, aphids still active and they were seeing BYDV and aphids have to pick up BYDV from somewhere. They're not born with BYDV. So, you know, if there's a lot in the in the area from, say, the winter crops have a lot of BYDV and there's a lot of aphids around, that means your spring crops will be more at risk because there's a reservoir there of BYDV. Well, you know, if you've had a very cold winter, you may not have um, the pressure in the spring because it, it's not around. And speaking of which, actually, in terms of lots of aphids being around, there, there was a lot of aphids carrying on into a lot of the winter crops, actually, especially I suppose people noticed them earlier in on winter barley. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of aphids down in the canopy, if you like, and are still there, I suppose, at the moment. You can see a lot of ladybirds and um, different natural enemies at the moment, and that's a sign that there's a lot of aphids around, yeah. And is that something we, a farmer, should be worried about uh, in terms of is there a threshold for controlling barley or oats or wheat or, or, or what should a farmer do? Yeah, so there's thresholds for controlling aphids on the year. And what's great about that is you can give natural enemies a chance to help you in your control there because you know how many aphids um, is considered enough to spray for aphids on the year. So you're not spraying unnecessarily. You can monitor it and give you know, natural enemies a chance to help. And um, so that does exist there. But but I think there was some questions about whether they should have been sprayed post 31. Um, and I would say no, just because we're not trying to kill every aphid in in a crop all the time. We're just trying to kill the ones or control the ones that are yield impacting. So we're not trying to clean the crop all the time. So if you're seeing aphids, you know, after ghost stage 31, before you get to aphid on the year, you know, that's not something you'd be spraying for. Okay, and 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 just thinking about the um as as you as you call it the control measures of spraying for transform, which is um one of the I suppose the newer insecticides that just mm-hmm. came on the market. It looks like it's not going to be there after the end of this year. How significant of a loss is that going to be? Yeah, so that's the loss of I suppose the chemistry is sulfoxiflor. So that is a loss for us because it would put pressure on. The chemistry remaining you know a few years ago we had neonicotinoid sea treatments and we had pyrethroids and and when you have multiple chemistries it helps you manage resistance because you can alternate chemistries uh, one chemistry might uh, pick up the if it's left by another chemistry if there's resistance there so the loss of sulfoxifor or transform um, may put more pressure on pyrethroids because they'll be the only insecticide remaining uh, for control of BYDV. And we already know that there is resistance, partial resistance in our grain aphid populations to um, pyrethroids. So that's something we will be monitoring ongoing and we monitor every year to know what the levels are like. So it's not going to get any better, I suppose. That's the, that's the holy no, order. It's, no, it's going to no. get more, more so than better, I suppose. Yeah, because when you're looking at years like this with the mild weather, you know, the insecticides can be quite important. And then if there's only one, there's a lot of pressure on it, that might be of concern. Okay, so just switching back maybe to spring crops for a second. There, there's, um, I suppose, quite a lot of reports from farmers talking about quite a bit of yellowing out there, and and and, and we did a little bit of uh, counting out there from some crops around the, um, I, I suppose, the Leinster region, probably more so than anything else, and they vary from, um, you know, what average shoot numbers somewhere around eleven hundred to thirteen hundred shoots per meter squared. So that's a lot of shoots in in a particular meter, but. In terms of the yellowing that you can see in BYDV, anywhere from about 0.5 of a percent up to eight percent. Um, so just in in that where you have eight percent, it looks terrible. And a farmer, I suppose, uh, maybe their eye, like everybody's eye, is drawn to the yellow rather than to the green. In terms of those levels, have we seen those levels before? And is it something to worry about? I suppose we saw high levels in the same kind of pattern back in 2017 in spring barley. Um, And as I said a little bit earlier, we were talking about whether or not BYDV will cause yield loss. So it will matter when the crop got infected. So, for example, we're seeing BYDV in in March crops as well as in April crops. Um, And the question would be whether that BYDV got in a little bit later, closer to growth stage 31, it may but not be as yield impacting. And also what strain is that BYDV? Because when we look at the winter crops, we see some stunting, uh, which is obviously concerning for yield. We're not seeing that stunting in any of the spring barley crops we've looked at. And to probably give you a guide maybe for percentage BYDV and yield loss, so what Tom Kennedy found, so he did trials from 1990 to about, I think, 2001 in spring barley. 
And he found for April sown barley that had 7% um, BYDV, it got a 0.36 ton per hectare loss. When it was 10% BYDV, which he considered moderate infections, we considered seven low, he considered 10% moderate, that was a 0.65 ton per hectare loss. And then he considered high at around 20% he was seeing in, in some plots, and he was losing a 1.1 ton per hectare. But I guess the caveat being that that's plot scale as opposed to field scale. But that gives you a kind of idea of, of the yields that were lost in the past. But yes, like 8% looks very dramatic because BYDV is very eye-catching. It's very bright. And if you want to assess the amount of BYDV in your field, you you know you need to look at the percentage tillers that are yellowing and the percentage tillers that aren't, um, r- rather than just judging by eye because um, it does look quite dramatic. It's never, it's, it's never as bad as you think it is. I think that's yeah. that'd be my information of it when, I, when I'm often going into crops. In terms, you mentioned the strains there before, uh, and and looking at it by eye, can you tell if you're a farmer or an agronomist going into your field? Can you tell what strain it is, whether it's MAV or PAV, or 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 is that something more on a kind of molecular level you'd have to tell? Yeah, so it's more on a molecular level, but that is something we're doing with farmers at the moment. So we have a project called the Aid Project, which is a, a new project that started this year. And we're working with farmers um, around 20 sites per season. So we have yellow traps on the farmer's field and they empty them and they put them out every two weeks and empty them after three days. And then they send them into us. We identify the aphids, we test the aphids for resistance and for BYDB. And to go with that, we, well, I say we, um, Liam Shepherd that works with me also does this. Um, we look at the aphids within the crop, see what levels are within the crop compared to the yellow traps. And then we also assess the field on a field scale for BYDV. And then those leaves are also going to be tested for the strain. So for those 20 sites every spring and autumn, uh, we will know what strain of BYDV was there, what species of aphids were carrying that, and what proportion of the aphids had resistance. And we'll be doing that for three years for spring and autumn. So that should give us a lot of information about what's happening out there in the country. Okay. Well, that's put together with your tower data. We should should be getting to a, a, good a really good um, view of what's happening, I suppose, in, in a general sense. Yeah, but we know, say, we also are um, sampling. Uh, we do a 50 field survey we've done last year and this year. And we know at the moment that there is a variety in the strains that are out there. So we're in the middle of doing the work at the moment, but we're seeing... Um, GAV, which is a subspecies of MAV. We're seeing PAS, which is a more severe um, than MAV would be. So we're seeing a variety of strains out there. Okay. And uh, I suppose in spring crops out there where a, a farmer might be patting himself on the back or, and, and saying, God, you know what? I did a great job because I see very little of no BYTV in, in, in my crop. Um, whereas mm-hmm. the guy next door um, might be thinking, well, I did the best I could and I still have some. And I suppose the question is, should a farmer or is it, I suppose, um, acceptable that a farmer will always have a little bit of BYDV or some degree of BYDV in their crop? So I suppose it really depends on the field. Like, for example, we have a field in Cork where we did a trial and the field is very clean. But then you look down around the other fields and they all have BYDV. Um it doesn't necessarily mean that in spring barley, if you got BYDV, something went wrong. It's just as a very high pressure year. And, you know, we have to accept that in very, very high pressure times, it can be very hard to control all of the virus because aphids are arriving in the crop all the time. So to clean up all those aphids is, is very challenging. But it's not to panic when we see yellow. It's to see we need to follow through now and see how that affects yield. OK, and it might be coming back to some of your figures you had earlier, maybe that. Yeah. Uh, Seven percent is is looked upon as a relatively low infection, um, and anything and most of the figures that I gave you before that we done when we did the, around the, there, yeah. were were well below that for the most part. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that that's good in itself. And just to add to that, um, we have a six year trial. We're in the last year of it now in Oak Park, where we have five planting dates, um, starting at start of March, running to the end of April. Um, for spring barley and we do them sprayed and unsprayed so at the end of this year that will all be after this season is harvested that will all be put together and we'll be able to tell farmers again uh, with more recent trials what we saw for the last six years and um, depending on when you planted and if you spread or if you didn't uh, how well was it controlling BYDV. Okay okay so finally I suppose that you're talking about some some of your uh, trials there is there any other 
um, bits and pieces of research that are that are coming out that you'd like to share with us today? Um, I suppose the big one for us is the aid project that's starting. So um, there will be a PhD starting on that later in the year with Harper Adams and ADAS. And we hope that through doing the yellow trapping network, we will be able to compare how infield sampling compares to suction tire sampling. And um, that will be able to help farmers know how best to monitor. And we'll also be looking at the role of tolerant varieties or resistant varieties in the IPM program. So if you're planting them, do you need to spray or not? And um, we'll be looking at that as well. So that's our big project now next that we're hoping will give a lot of information to help direct farmers in their control of UIDV. Thanks, Louise. It's certainly all very relevant, I suppose, certainly in the context that we uh, have uh, increasing resistance to, our, to to what chemistry we're, we're going to have left. And some of the new ones that we thought we'd have are going to be taken away from, from farmers. So certainly all of the, um, the, 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 the work and the guidance that can be given over the next number of years, I think will be um, gratefully accepted. And just to add, if any farmers are interested in being involved in, in that Yellow Chapel network, they can let their their Chagas advisor know or send me an email on louise.mcnamara at chagas.e and we'd be happy to have them involved. Perfect. The more, more people involved, the better, I presume. That's it. Yeah. So that's all we've time for. And my thanks to Louise for joining me in the podcast today. Chagas have a number of ECT walks happening around the country in the coming weeks in Waterford and in Kildare. These walks are looking at grass weed control and how to get the best results in different establishment systems. For more information, go to chagas.ie forward slash tillage month. Finally, don't forget if you enjoyed this podcast and recommend it to a friend or colleague. And as always, rate, review and follow on Apple Podcast or Spotify so you never miss an episode. And for more information, go to chagas.ie. I'm Michael Hennessy. Thanks for listening and I'll be back next week with more tillage news and advice.